This is Strong Medicine's Intern Crash Course, and today I'm giving you 10 tips on the physical exam. Start your exam with an examination of the patient's hands. First, there are many illnesses which are associated with hand findings. But more importantly, starting with the hand establishes physical connection between the patient and doctor without requiring the patient to reveal a part of their body that isn't already seen by every person they meet. For patients who are not entirely comfortable being touched by a stranger, this can help to ease them into it. Tailor your physical exams to the patient's symptoms and past medical history. Every patient should neither get the same exam on admission, nor the same exam on subsequent hospital days. So, if your patient was admitted for heart failure, or an acute MI, look at the JVP each day. And if they were admitted for liver failure, check every day for asterixis. The patient's heart rate should never be used as a primary indicator of volume status. There are a million reasons besides hypovolemia that a patient can develop tachycardia. Well, maybe not a million, but a lot. Reflexively giving fluid to every tachycardic patient leads to preventable volume overload and risks iatrogenic respiratory failure. Don't be too reassured by a normal O2 sat in a patient with dyspnea. There are many life-threatening problems that can cause dyspnea without hypoxemia. For example, acute coronary syndrome, tamponade, pulmonary embolism, and an asthma exacerbation. If a patient with any of these conditions is becoming hypoxemic, the condition is already likely severe, and you want to catch these diagnoses before that happens. Every patient who is physically able to stand warrants a gait and balance assessment. It's the very rare patient in whom cranial nerve testing is more relevant than how well they can walk. If you're struggling to obtain a good sound with percussion, try percussing with a reflex hammer onto your finger. The sound will be louder and easier to distinguish resonant from dull. In fact, what we now know as reflex hammers were at first used by physicians for percussion before the discovery that they were also great for eliciting the deep tendon reflexes. If your patient has a physical disability that might impact your ability to perform a particular bedside maneuver, don't just assume that the maneuver cannot be done. Instead, explain to the patient what you'd like to check and ask them with their knowledge of their body if that's going to be possible and what's the best way to do it. For example, if your patient has paraplegia and is sitting in a wheelchair, but you need to do an abdominal exam. Or if your patient is blind, but a gait assessment is indicated. You know, I, I appreciate the desire to be considerate about a person's disability and not wanting to embarrass or inconvenience them. But if there is something that you would check on an able-bodied individual, you should check it on a person with a disability too, if at all possible. Do a rectal and or genital and or breast exam whenever indicated, but if you anticipate another member of the team will also want to do it, for example, an attending wanting to double check your potentially abnormal findings, try to get everyone together to do the exam one time jointly. That's not always possible, and you don't want to delay your exam for too long because you want to try to batch exams, but patients really appreciate when you can do kind of these exams all at once. The majority of patients with tamponade do not present with hypotension. I know that may be surprising, but if you're skeptical, there's a link to the literature in the video description. And the final tip for today, the auscultation of bowel sounds are worthless. However, something actually useful to do with the stethoscope on the abdomen is when a patient is reporting abdominal pain. First, listen to the abdomen, but while doing so, push down with the stethoscope relatively firmly to actually assess for tenderness. And then after listening, press down in the same area with the same uh, force using your hands doing traditional palpation. Now, just because a patient only winces during palpation and not during auscultation does not mean that the patient must be lying about their pain, but it should change your assessment of how severe that person's tenderness might be.